This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome to the Condo Insider. Everything you ever wanted to know about living in a condo, owning a condo, maybe even being on the board of directors of a condo. And today we've got a, a very interesting subject that we haven't touched on before, but I thought it would be a good one for us to do. And that is in regards to leasehold condominiums. And my guest is an old friend and sitting commissioner right now on the Hawaii Real Estate Commission, and that's Mike Pang. I am glad to have you here, Mike. Me too. I'm happy. Are you sure to be about here. that now? <laughs> we'll, we'll see. <laughs> well, before we get into this issue of leasehold condominiums, um, why don't you give us a little background on how you got involved in leasehold issues on condominium associations? Good place to start right from the beginning. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and pardon me if I refer to my notes. Uh, people will find in this half hour that leasehold is a ton of stuff. Oh, yes. And uh, I have to stay on track here. Uh, 1991, the Honolulu Board of Realtors was asked by the council to opine on land reform for condos, uh, forced condo sales. Um, everybody looked at each other and had, didn't have a clue of what to say. So <laughs> they convened the task force, and being the newest member of the uh, Honolulu Board of Realtors, they gave it to me. Uh, but it was a heck of an education. We met with landowners, uh, lessors, lessee groups, attorneys, appraisers. Uh, we looked at everything. Uh, and came to the conclusion that uh, the, the one imbalance we had was information. Mm -hmm. uh, having the right information on both sides and having a balance of information would balance the playing field. And so with that, they went off and they, uh, they gave their opinion to the council. Uh, what happened to me, though, is the phone rang one day and somebody says, I've got a fee offer and I think it's too high. Can I negotiate it? So, well, everything's negotiable. So we took on a case uh, more informally, and then some, the phone rang the next day and says, I have a rent renegotiation I gotta go through. Can you help us with that? Um, and the phone kept ringing and ringing, so a few years later, the phone rang so much, um, I decided I would get into representing condo projects and fee conversions and rent renegotiations, right. ultimately lease extensions. Um, to the point where, uh, before I retired a couple of years ago, we had done about, 80% uh, of the condo fee conversions in the state over the past 15 wow. years, and the majority of rent renegotiations. Uh, it's, it's a deep subject people find, and so no one else really came around to take a piece of that marketplace, and so we just got very busy with it. Well, you got a good chunk of that marketplace, but you also had to take an additional aspirin every day for dealing with it, right? Two. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, leasehold condominiums, um, are a subject that's not talked about often, and the reason I wanted you on the show is I taught a class recently, and there were a few s young students in there who really didn't understand the concept of a leasehold condominium or what it really means, so I thought, hey, this is a perfect subject for the Condo Insider as well. Yeah, I think it is an excellent subject because uh, people still have a very low understanding yep. uh, of the concepts, even realtors, uh, even some attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jay. Anyhow, um, I think what we should do is start at the beginning. How yep. did we get into the system and what is the system basically? Um, think post-World War II, uh, the GIs coming home, starting families. Suddenly there's a great demand for housing on Oahu, but there wasn't a lot of landowners willing to sell their land outright uh, for development. Uh, we didn't have condominiums, we didn't have co-ops, we had some apartment buildings. Yep. So there was this great demand. So in 1951, somebody came up with the idea of doing a leasehold co-op. And they created the lease, and here's the problem, that has a structure of roughly 55 years, uh, 30 years of known lease rent, that was for uh, uh, mortgage purposes or fixed amounts of rent, you mm -hmm. knew exactly what it's gonna be, but, and then you rent through some rent uh, renegotiation periods. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, re lease rents went sky high, uh, but they also then stuck in a surrender clause at the end. The landowner was gonna get the building and the land back, everybody would have to leave at the end of the lease. Finally, landowners in bunches says, I'll sign on to that. So from 1951 to 1961, 39 leasehold cooperatives were developed mm -hmm. on Oahu. Mostly on Oahu, uh, mostly Waikiki, but a few outside of Waikiki. Um, in 1961, Hawaii passed the first condo statute. And sure enough, the first condos to be developed, <laughs> they did it in leasehold. Landowners couldn't wait to give up their land. They get a bunch of money up front, units in the building, lease rent for the next 55 years, and they get this great concrete building back in 55 years. And they went on and on. 
at the high, uh, we had a about 600 plus or minus leasehold condo and co-op projects in the state encompassing about 70,000 apartments. Wow. Um, that was more than what we had in uh, Fee Simple. We also had 25,000 or so leasehold single family homes. Mm -hmm. So we had almost 100,000 housing dwellers um, in a leasehold system that required unlimited lease rent increases during renegotiation times, uncapped, uh, and a surrender of the property at the end of the yeah. lease. Um, it, it was the greatest concentration of residential leasehold ever in the world. Uh, although Japan is trying right now to catch us up very quickly <laughs> for some reason, uh, but and a few little smidges of it around the United States, but not very much at all. The concept that we developed here became problematic right away because it was designed on a commercial leasehold concept, mm -hmm. known rents unlimited rent renegotiation tied to land value fluctuation and surrender of the property at the end. It doesn't really work well in a residential context when it's people's homes. Uh, by 1969, the state legislator fig legislature figured this out. Remember, this is only eight years after yeah. we started leasehold condos. And they passed land reform, which was mandatory conversion uh, for, it was supposed to be for all the properties in Hawaii. Uh, it didn't get adjudicated for 15 years. It went through, had to go through the, a lot of appeals and challenges up to the U.S. Supreme Court. It was finally cleared for use in 1984. Uh, by 1990, 80% of single-family leasehold was converted to fee simple. And I'll, I'll, I'll add to that is that my father lived in a single-family home in IAEA that was on leasehold land. Then he moved, sells it, moves to Maui, buys fee simple. He was so excited. He, got this house on half an acre with that was fee simple. And then he sat there in the dining room one night and said, what the hell am I going to do with half an acre? <laughs> <laughs> For the rest of his yeah. life, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, so the system created some problems. Uh, the government started to get involved. Um, uh, but condos were eliminated from land reform along the way, mm -hmm. uh, based on the concept of oligopoly. Uh, in other words, a few Large landowners controlled most, almost all of the single-family leaseholds, yes. but many, many condo landowners uh, controlled the condo leaseholds. And so based on oligopoly or the failure of oligopoly, they got tossed. Uh, and there was really nothing for condos until 19, I'm sorry, 1991, when the city council of Oahu, for Oahu only, passed uh, Chapter 38, uh, single, I'm sorry, condo mandatory fee conversion, mm -hmm. uh, if you had certain qualifying amounts. Uh, by 1998, about seven years later, the law was fully adjudicated through the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and um, people started converting. At that time, there were about 50,000 leasehold condos and co-ops in Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, by 2005, when the law got repealed, so seven years later, the law got repealed by the council, by a new council, uh, we're down to about 15,000. Oh, okay. So looking at single family and condos, Mandatory conversion laws result in what the original legislative intent was, was to get out of this leasehold system, mm -hmm. which is onerous on, on people. Um, it was a great argument, though, because landowners looked at the contract, the lessees looked at the social issues, and they had to be balanced very carefully. Well, there's also been this conception, for years I've heard it as well, is that the idea also was, well, if I buy the unit and rent the land, it's going to be cheaper to do it that way than buying a fee simple condo. But even in my experience in the 80s and 90s, it didn't matter if it was leasehold or fee simple, they were basically selling at about the same price depending on where they were located at. Yeah, we'll get into valuation yeah. of things, but market trends, especially when the marketplace is very tight and there's not a lot of housing available, people in the 80s were buying up leasehold condos to be almost the same value as fee simple. Yep and they paid too much, but that was the market influences. <laughs> they would buy anything, and it, it just got up, uh, going up that, quite a bit that way. And I, I'm glad you did bring up the subject of the leasehold um, single family, because that's sort of a little bit of history that people have forgotten, um, that there was a period of time a good chunk of residential property, at least here on, on Oahu, was held in leasehold. And so, that mandatory conversion, some people have forgotten about that little bit of history. Yeah, all of Kailua, all of Hawaii Kai, and big chunks of Aea were, mm -hmm. were developed single-family leasehold. All of Waikiki, except for the Ilikai, was developed as leasehold condominiums. 
you know, 70% of Makiki. So it was rampant at one time. You know, you'll see we're down to probably 60, I'm sorry, six or 7,000 Liso condos left in the state. But uh, it's, it's been, you know, hard slugging it all out. Well, one of the points you made is on the residential leasehold, there were just a few large landowners who were involved in that, and that was part of the reason they got the mandatory conversion. But the individual condo buildings on leasehold land, a lot of times that was just family land or put into trust by the family for future use and things like that. So that's why it wasn't, let's say, a monopoly. Yeah, it's, it's a pure numbers game. Many landowners, I think about 250 at one time, owning leasehold condominiums mm -hmm. under roughly 600 projects. Kamehameha Schools is the largest with 112, and a lot of them were one to mom and pop lessors, yeah. as we call them. Uh, so there were many, many more of those, and it just didn't stand the test of oligopoly yeah. for, the, for the court. Because I've gotten that question before. Well, if they forced the residential, why didn't they force the condo? And that was basically the issue right there. Right, right. Oh. So we got our little history lesson. <laughs> <laughs> and as you pointed out, um, the original uh, idea on leasehold was more of a commercial idea, but they were applying it to residential. Yeah, that was the mistake. Yeah. 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 Um, well, the legislature very rarely makes mistakes. So. <laughs> um, so then we get into this issue that, and I've dealt with them, and that's one of the reasons I know you the way I do is because you do lease rent ne renegotiations, or did before you retired. Um, and I've been involved in a couple, and that's where it really shocks some homeowners sometimes. Yeah, it, it, just going through one will, will be a surprise to a lot of people because <laughs> there's no cap, there's no set dollar amount. Um, rent renegotiations occur generally three times during a lease. Mm -hmm. We've talked the structure of about a 55-year lease, 30 years of fixed or known rent, but then they reopen or renegotiate once every 10 years. Yes. And that's so the landowner can bring the rents up to current market value for the time. The rent renegotiation clauses in the typical lease is based on a percentage of land value. For example, if you had a condominium with 100 units and a $10 million land value, and they had a lease that said the rent will be based on land value times 8%, you know, it's $100,000 per unit, 8% of that, that is $8,000, and that would be the new rent for the next 10 years. Yeah. And they go through the whole process again. So lease rents are based on land value fluctuation over time. And in Hawaii, land values generally tend to only go up. And so the first re rent reopenings, because landowners did a lousy job of estimating up front, <laughs> uh, were 7, 10, I, I saw 15 times higher than yeah. what the original was. Uh, and that was a surprise to a lot of people. Well, even one that I had on the outskirts of being involved in, they went from an, an average of, depending on the unit, $95 a month to $120 a month, and then they shot over $600 a month after renegotiation, and they were oceanfront. <laughs> Especially for oceanfront. But you know, it, that be makes it unaffordable to some people. Yep. So, uh, there's always going to be some people with marginal affordability that may be just retired, that that kind of a bump they just can't handle, and so what it jeopardizes their ownership or it jeopardizes their staying there, which was the social issue. Yeah. Okay, well, let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll learn some more about leasehold condominiums right here on the Condo Insider. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, I'm RV Kelly, host of Out of the Comfort Zone, and Think Tech is important to our community because it gives us a chance to learn more. We get to learn more, we get to give more, we get to grow more. Now for the first time, Think Tech Hawaii is participating in an online web-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to Think Tech will run only during the month of November and you can help. Please donate what you can so that Think Tech Hawaii can continue to raise public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming like mine. I've already made my donation and I look forward to yours. Please send in your tax deductible contribution by going to this website. Thanks for thinktech.causebox.com. On behalf of the community enriched by Think Tech Hawaii's 30 plus weekly shows, mahalo for your generosity. Welcome back to the Condo Insider, and my guest here today again is, is Mr. Pang, who we 
just went over a little bit of a history lesson on why leasehold, where it came from, where it's, what it's doing. And now we get into the issue is, I know there's a lot of condominiums um, throughout the state of Hawaii, it's not just Oahu, that are either on their last renegotiation or maybe coming close to the end of the lease. Mm -hmm. So in the time we have left, that would be a great place because I think owners and realtors need to understand what those issues are. Yeah, and this is where it gets a little hard. The, yeah. the history lesson is pretty easy. <laughs> uh, this is where the difficulty comes. Um, so I thought we'd start with understanding the different interests in real estate, leasehold, lease fee, and, and uh, fee simple. Mm -hmm. So I decided to use a prop. I, I brought a piece of paper here. <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's a bad prop. Uh, this is the full bundle of rights. This is what the landowner owned before they committed their uh, land to a lease and then somebody put up a lease on condominium. Mm -hmm. Full fee simple bundle of rights. Once they sign the lease with the developer to put the building up, they no longer own the fee simple value. They own what they call the leased fee interest. It's yeah. the fee interest subject to the lease. They don't own the use right of the bundle of rights. Yeah. They've given that and they, or they've leased it to the lessees. So the apartment owner is a lessee under the lease. The lessor is the landowner uh, is uh, under the lease yeah. of the leased fee interest. Okay? And it stays like this until the end of the lease. At the end of the lease, the leasehold interest uh, reverts back to the fee owner, the mm -hmm. lessee is gone, and he owns the building and everything on it, uh, the land and everything on it in fee. During the term here, though, what's happened many times, and remember we started with 70,000 condos, we're down to about 6,000 yep. now, many, many condominiums have converted to fee. So the leasehold apartment owner has bought the lease fee interest from the lessor and made a fee simple condominium unit. Okay. That's how the interest works. Very simple, plain, yep. the pie thing here works very well for that. The problem comes in valuing this stuff. <laughs> um, because in valuing it, the value of a leasehold apartment uh, plus the value of the fee doesn't necessarily equal the full fee civil yeah. value. Or the mistake uh, uh, people have been making is they look at the full value of the fee, uh, they say, well, uh, some units in my project have sold at this value, so the difference must be the least fee for the fee owner, and that's what I'll go in and offer them to buy the fee. Not necessarily the case. Yeah. Case and example here, uh, before I retired a couple years ago, one of the last conversions we handled um, was for a project, and I'm going to use round numbers. The, the units were selling for $500,000 fee simple. They were, it was a mixed project, so there were also some leasehold units in the building, <laughs> and they were selling for $200,000 leasehold. So people bought it for $200,000, thinking one day I'll buy the fee, it'll be $300,000. They went to the fee owner and the fee owner uh, and said, can I buy the fee? The fee owner says, we'll appraise it. The appraisal came back $450,000 just for, for the, the least fee. fee interest. And so they just suddenly went, you know, I just, what I owned, bought and owned for $200,000 went to down to fifty. The real answer on that is they didn't know what they were buying and they didn't know how to value it. Mm -hmm. or they didn't know how to come to the value. So they paid too much for their leasehold interest. And that's very common out there. Uh, if, if there's only two things that everybody takes away from this today uh, is to understand that the value of the leasehold, plus the value of the lease fee that owner owns doesn't necessarily equal the fee simple yeah. value of the unit. Here's why. Uh, leasehold apartments, if you want to sell a leasehold apartment, you give it to your realtor, they stick it on the open market, the marketplace comes, and they pay a certain amount of money. You look up the last three sales in your building for similar fees, uh, leasehold units, and that's roughly what the, your value is going to be. The same thing if you have a fee simple apartment. Okay, uh, you go on the open market, the last three sales pretty much determine what your value is there. Lease fee sales are closed market transactions. Mm -hmm. You don't put them on the open market. You could, but the fact has been from the very beginning that the buyer that will pay the most is the leasehold owner of the apartment, the, le the person who owns that leasehold interest. Yeah. They will pay the most. So why would a landowner stick it out looking for other people to pay a fraction of that? They just go right to the lessee of the <laughs> apartment or the condo association. So because of that, the least fee interest, what the fee owner owes and sells and what you need to make your apartment fee simple uh, is done by an economic calculation called discounted cash flow to determine the full present value of the lessor's interest. What is the value of the land today grown to the end of the lease? discounted to today's present value by a discount rate, and all you need to know is a discount rate is the opposite of an interest rate, where you grow interest, this uh, discounts it to present value. Mm -hmm. And what is all the lease rent that you might pay to the end of the lease in today's dollar value? So then you come up with the present value of the lessor's lease fee interest, and that's roughly what the market value would be 
for that interest. And as the leases get short and more of the interest for portions of the fee owner, as funny things occur when it gets very short, like the appraisers start considering the improvements and the units and things, the value of the fee tends to spike upwards yeah. towards the end of the lease and things like that will happen. Okay, now I gotta wrap my head around all that financial <laughs> stuff, but I think one of the issues, not just on the price, you know, is, is a person who owns a leasehold, if they have the opportunity to go into fee, that's their incentive personally because they want to be whole, so to speak. Right. And so that's where you have emotion and finance sort of working against or with each other. It depends on how it's working out. Yeah, that's true. But th we came up with an interesting stat. We kept a lot of stats when I was uh, doing this. <laughs> we, we kept interesting stats. And in a condo project, the uh, whenever the fee came available, just about everybody could do it would do it. Yeah. That's owner occupants and investors who you think would be more cerebral with these things. Uh, but for some reason, they were equally incentivized uh, to buy the fee. You would think the homeowner to protect their home would do would have more incentive, but uh, they bought in the same proportions to investors. That was very interesting. Well, you know, there's also a misconception there as well. The last one was my own building that I was in a number of years ago. We converted to fee simple. All but three people bought fee. Um, and the board at that time says, okay, well, the association bought the, the, the fee for the other three units. Mm -hmm. And their thought process is, well, once we own the fee, we can jack up the rent, the lease rent on those people. And of course, then they had a hard learning lesson after that from the person who was involved. In <laughs> yeah, yeah, even the simple thought that you have to follow the formula in the lease to set the rents uh, is escaped by a lot of uh, yeah. people. <laughs> exactly. But you had pointed out earlier that there's not as many leasehold units, so to speak, mm -hmm. out there. Um, I can remember there was an article in the Star Bulletin or something a number of years back who was sort of like the sky is falling type of article, what's going to happen to all these condo units when their lease expires. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen the sky fall yet. Well, the, the reason is it hasn't fallen yet. <laughs> um, look at this very interesting thought. At one point we had 70,000 leasehold condos. Uh, fast forward uh, roughly 20 years and suddenly we're down to 50,000. Yeah. And then land reform comes, or a mandatory conversion for condo comes in 91, and by uh, 2005, we're down to 15. And between 2005 and now, which is 12 years later, we're down to six. Fee conversions happen without having to overly incentivize the fee owners. And the reason is the economics. Mm -hmm. It is more economically beneficial. Did I say that right? It is more economically <laughs> beneficial for the fee owner to sell the fee to the lessees than do anything else. Yeah. Uh, and so we've seen as some of these leases have come up, some, and I'm only talking condos now, uh, about 15 condo leases have come up for expiration so far. Mm -hmm. And none of them have the lessors or the landlord come back to retake the property and kick the people out. Number one reason is nobody wants to kick anybody out. <laughs> but the bigger one is uh, the economics. Uh, there's a very famous case. The last fee conversion I did was for two co-ops in Makiki. And the landowner said, for decades and decades, I'll never sell, don't even ask. So they never even tried. Just before the lease expired a few years ago, he went in to see his attorney, and he said, what should I do at the end of the lease? I'm going to get this thing back in six months. <laughs> and the attorney, like a smart attorney, says, I'm going to get an appraised to, to value all of your end uses. So they did. And they went and they valued selling the fee to the lessees, taking the building back, refurbishing, selling fee simple condominiums, uh, extending the lease for the lessees, taking the building back and doing it as a rental project long term. And uh, the economic fact was selling it to the lessees was far more lucrative than any other of their other end uses from that end use analysis. The FINA then goes, well, okay, I'm hit pushing 90 and uh, I would like to set up my family, so let's just sell the thing. And that happens over and over again, we see today, that when the landowner finally wants to look and address what to do at the end, they'll look at these end use analyses and decide to sell it. And some who really have an attachment to the land will extend the leases. I expect um, from this point forward that most condo owners, I'm not talking co-ops, most condo owners uh, will either have a chance to buy the fee or extend the leases, and very few uh, I can think of one famous example uh, on the coast of Kahala, but very few 
uh, will actually have to surrender and get kicked out and the lander will take back the property just because it's against their economic benefit to do so. So do you think in your mind with what is left out there in leasehold condominiums that there is a market, there's still somebody who's going to buy a leasehold condominium? Uh, there's always risk takers. <laughs> and I would say that uh, buying a leasehold condominium has many risks. Uh, rent renegotiations in the future, will the landowner take it back? Will they sell? If so, when? And for how much? Are they going to be what I call overly aggressive? Are they going, because they can ask whatever they want, yeah. and it's up to you to take it or not. Or are they going to be fair and do it on appraised values? You know, uh, are they going to be decent about it? And that's a lot of risk to take on if you don't understand uh, each one of those different aspects to analyze whether you should buy or not, or how much should you pay or not. What we do see, though, is when leases get really short, under 10 years, and certainly by five years, people will spend a certain amount of money on buying a leasehold condo just because it's cheaper than rent. Yes. I might kick in $20,000 here because that, and plus maintenance fees, is cheaper than rent for me over the next 10 years. And maybe I'll get a chance to buy it towards well, the end. It's funny you bring that up because I had a friend of mine who bought a very, very cheap leasehold unit, paid 25 for it, um, about 10 or 11 years later, sold it for 2500 because the lease was really getting close to ending. And I asked him, I said, were you upset about the difference in the price? And he says, no, it was a vacation rental all these years. I made my money back, so the $2,500 was just gravy. Unfortunately, the realtor who sold it could only go to McDonald's dollar menu for her commission check. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, like you said, there's always risk takers in any kind of environment like that. So. Oh yeah, yeah, and you know, they're there, you know, and when leases get short, they'll, they'll buy them for 10, 15, or $20,000 <laughs> and uh, take their chances. Yeah. Uh, but what, what will happen though, uh, we've got leases, a lot of them are expiring now. Uh, well, Harvey Shapiro, who was the economist for the Board of Realtors, did amazing amount of statistics, because there's no clearinghouse for leasehold information. When the lease is uh, renegotiated, when's the peak of that, when they expire, when the end of it. Uh, I'm hoping that in the next few decades, we'll see the end of residential leasehold. I agree, I leasehold. agree. Uh, it, was a mis it was a system that was, had really good intentions of creating housing, and it did. But then the concept that was brought into place to make it attractive for landowners, otherwise they wouldn't have done it, uh, a little, I think went a little overboard and uh, had some social issues to it. So I think it'll be gone. Uh, well, again, 30 minutes goes amazingly fast, and you did a lot of information in that 30 minutes. So I want to thank you again for being here on the Condo Insider. It's been a pleasure to talk to you about this, and maybe we'll get you in again, talk a little more about this later on once you've recovered from this episode. My pleasure as well. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> and again, thank you for joining us here on the Condo Insider. Be sure to tune in on Thursdays at 3 o'clock for more information on what it is to be in the condo world.